This podcast sketches out the storyline of the book of Joshua. As uh, I've said many times before, the Bible is not a history book or a science book or a geology book, and it's not a law book. It's not really even a book of ethical, moral instruction. What it is is a storybook. And through the stories that it tells us, it tells us about God and about his desires for us and towards us and tells us things that we need to know about ourselves and our world. Also tells us, most of all, the stories about how God interacts with people and the lessons that we need to learn from that. Following the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, comes the story of Joshua. The storyline begins with the death of Moses, and uh, Joshua then is commissioned by God to lead Israel. Now, Joshua had been, in a sense, second in command under Moses, but now he becomes the official leader of Israel in his own right. And God says to him, essentially, um, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Don't be afraid. Be strong. Be fearless. I will take care of things. Uh, Do what I say, be faithful, and all will be well. One of Joshua's first acts is to send out a group of spies to go into the land of Canaan, the land that God has promised to Israel, the land that they are about to invade, the land that they are going to conquer and take over as their dwelling place, their home land, their territory. He sends out these spies, and they uh, check out things and come back with a report about their very first target, which is the city of Jericho. Jericho is a, was then a large fortified city uh, not too far from the Jordan River. They cross the Jordan, and uh, they have quite a ceremony there as they cross the Jordan and officially mark their entrance into the promised land, um, uh, the land that was promised to their forefather Abraham and subsequently to them, kind of a get down and kiss the ground sort of thing. And... Uh, They reaffirm, then, the covenant that God made with Abraham and uh, that he reestablished with them when he led them out of Egypt and on the way to the Promised Land. Now, you have to remember that they have been 40 years on this journey, and the generation that left Egypt are all dead, except for just a very few, a handful, literally. And um, those who are now making up the population of the people of Israel were not a part of that dedication, that that covenanting that took place when they originally left Egypt and stopped by Sinai and so on. So this whole new generation has to be reconsecrated. And an important part of that is the circumcision of all the males to reaffirm the covenant that was made with Abraham. You may remember that when Abraham and God made that covenant, Uh, God said to Abraham, you and all of your male children will be circumcised as a sign that you belong to me. This was an intimate, private uh, symbol that Abraham and his descendants were uniquely God's people. And uh, it probably had something to do with the intimate nature of their relationship and the whole idea of covenanting and promise and so on. So this new generation is circumcised, and when they have healed up, uh, Joshua says, all right, it is time to attack Jericho. And uh, they do this not by military might, but they do it in such a way as to demonstrate that it is actually God that wins the victory, not them. They march around the city, they blow the trumpets, the walls fall down, and uh, they have specific instructions by God to go in and to slaughter every living thing in the city of Jericho. This has given a lot of people a lot of trouble. But uh, one way to understand this is that all of these people in Jericho were rebels against God and deserved to die. Um, But it still troubles people to know that um, this happened, to think that God would order such a thing. The problem is that God is not obeyed in this. Mostly he is, but there is at least one person whose name is Achan, who uh, instead of destroying everything and everybody, takes some animals that are desirable 
and also some goods that are desirable, some gold and some other stuff that's, that's valuable. And he takes it as loot, as booty. And um, this is a very bad thing. God is disobeyed. Now, it may seem to us that this is minor, but this is part of what the story is telling, see, is that God will be faithful to them if they are faithful to God. And faithfulness to God means obedience. It means trust. It means that they really take God seriously. And a lot of people get into a lot of trouble when they don't take God seriously. And that, of course, is what happens to Achan. He doesn't take God seriously. He doesn't think God really means it. He thinks he can come up with some kind of rationalization to get around it. And as a result, disaster falls on Israel at their next battle when they attempt to take the city of Ai. And uh, Ai is a smaller and less important and less fortified city than Jericho. And they expect that they're going to capture it easily. But instead, Israel is routed by the enemy forces and suffers a huge defeat. And when Joshua says to God, why? What happened? God reveals to Joshua that the reason it happened was because of sin in the camp of Israel, disobedience, distrust. And eventually, uh, through a process of judgment, um, it's revealed that Achan is the guilty person. And judgment falls uh, upon Achan and his family. They are destroyed because of their disobedience and their sin. You say, well, man, this seems really harsh. You know? and, and I suppose it does. On the other hand, you have to remember that God is doing something with these people. You know, I mean, they are uniquely his. He's fighting for them. He's building them into a nation. He's giving them a new territory, a new homeland. And if they're not going to trust him and um, be loyal and faithful to him, then this whole thing is not going to work. And so he is pretty harsh with them uh, when um, they disobey. Um, after the cleansing that the judgment brings, uh, the city of Ai falls easily to the forces of Israel, and uh, they go on to conquer city after city and to uh, conquer the whole southern part of the land of Canaan. The uh, storyline goes on to tell about conquests in northern Canaan, and after a number of victories, uh, a number of cities have fallen, a number of the inhabitants have been pushed out or destroyed, and at that point Joshua decides that it's time to divide up the land of Canaan among the various 12 tribes of Israel. And so he does just that. He divides up the land and gives each tribe its allotment of the overall territory. Um, and. Um, uh, the idea is that they will settle in that territory that will be their province, that will be their tribal land, they will own it forever and ever, and um, um, they will help their brother and brother tribes to uh, continue to carry out the conquest until all the land of Canaan uh, is free from the original inhabitants and belongs to the people of Israel. Um, at about this point, towards the end of the story, uh, Joshua leads the people of, of Israel in yet another renewal of the covenant. Uh, he doesn't have long to live. He's come to the end. It's been many, many years of fighting now. Um, and um, um, a whole generation has grown up just with their armor on and their sword in their hands, fighting almost constantly, conquering the territory, pushing their enemies back. And uh, now it's time to pause and look over what's been done and uh, renew the agreement with God. And be reminded that if they will be faithful to God, God will be faithful to them. And Joshua puts it to them very bluntly. He says, look, if you don't want to serve God, then you go serve somebody else. But don't sit on the fence. You know, Don't have one foot in the boat and one foot on the dock. Make up your mind. Um, choose ye this day whom you will serve. If God is God, then serve him. And if you don't think God is God, then go serve somebody else. But whatever you do, make up your mind. Get off the fence. Take a position, take a stand, either be faithful to God or depart from God's plan and God's people. And uh, the people resoundingly reaffirm their commitment to God. And soon after, Joshua dies and is buried. And that brings us to the end of the storyline in the book of Joshua. The uh, map here shows the distribution of the land among all the different tribes of Israel. Asher, Naphtali in the north and the far north, coming down Zebulun, the tribe of Issachar, over to the east of the Jordan, the tribe of Manasseh, and to the south on the east of Jordan, the tribe of Gad, 
and uh, the tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim, the tribe of Dan. Uh, in the south, the tribe of Judah that will eventually give their name to the whole southern land. In the southwest, the tribe of Simeon. To the east of the Dead Sea, the tribe of Reuben. And uh, you see the uh, Philistines, the land of Philistia, uh, off to the west, bordering the corner of the Mediterranean there. The Philistines will continue to be a thorn in the flesh of the Israelites for a long time to come. They keep pushing over this border and keep invading. But generally speaking, um, from uh, the Sea of Galilee uh, to the north, all the way to the Dead Sea in the south, um, Israel has been successful and has conquered these various cities, uh, Jericho and Samaria and Megiddo and so on, and um, established themselves in the land that was promised to Abraham.